All right, everyone, we'll begin in just a, a few short minutes. Please go to YouTube to watch this. Um, it's www.youtube.com backslash C backslash Cora Learning. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and begin. Um, it's good to see everyone here today. Uh, my name is Luke Wood, and I am serving as one of the professors for this class, Black Minds Matter, along with my, my colleague and, and friend, Donna Y. Ford. So uh, just a reminder, in terms of our own backgrounds, I'm serving as a um, professor of education at San Diego State University and also as vice president for student affairs and campus diversity. And you can see my Twitter handle there for engagement um, using the hashtag Black Minds Matter, hashtag Black Minds Matter. And you can also see the information for Donna Ford. Donna is a distinguished professor of education and human ecology and Kerwin Institute faculty affiliate at The Ohio State University of Education and Human Ecology. And you can see her respective Twitter handle there as well. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, there are two different ways that you can participate in this learning experience. One, you can just show up each week, each Thursday, and hear from our wonderful speakers and participate in that way. Um, there are also those who want to earn free CEUs. And if you go to the link here, corelearning.org backslash product backslash black dash minds dash matter, uh, you can go there and enroll, click on enroll in this course. and basically what you'll do is show that you've done the different videos associated with this class that you've completed the readings that we've recommended and you'll be able to uh, retrieve your, your certificate for receiving ceus and this is sponsored by the center for organizational responsibility advancement which is an authorized provider of uh, ceus We'd also like to thank our partnering organizations. We'd like to establish a special thank you to them for their support in the development and delivery of Black Minds Matter. We'd also like to remind you that there are Black Minds Matter t-shirts that you can purchase uh, from Shante Needham, who was uh, one of our guests last week. Shante is the sister of Sandra Bland. And if you go to Facebook and go to at NQL behind, you just um, can message her directly and be able to get um, a, a version of this shirt here that you see. In addition to Shantae, there's also Our Scholarship Matters, ourscholarshipmatters.com, uh, which has an array of different Black Minds Matter shirts that uh, were developed for the first two iterations of the series. And so we hope that you will also uh, support that as well if you want to be able to get t-shirts, coffee mugs, et cetera. Now, what I'd like to do is just jump right in um, and go back to where we left off, at least in terms of the lecture that I gave last time. And that was where I talked about three different patterns that we see uh, in the schooling of black students from preschool to doctoral level education. And those three patterns are distrust, disdain, and disregard. Um, as a reminder, distrust focuses on assumptions of criminality where we assume the students are dangerous, deviant, up to no good. And last time we talked about four primary patterns being suspected of wrongdoing, surveilled uh, because there's an assumption that you're going to do wrong, being singled out for punishment and then sentenced in terms of being subjected to punishments that are uh, longer and harsher. In addition, we also talked uh, briefly about being disdained, which is pathologizing culture. So what does that mean? Think about it as the they statements. They're lazy. They don't care. They're not really here for school. It's the ways that we convey to people that they are second class citizens while at the same time denigrating their, their lives and their culture. And then the last uh, theme that we talked about was disregard, where we have ascriptions of intelligence, where that means that we assume that some people based upon their race are academically inferior in comparison to others. And that's actually where we'll go today. Well, in terms of disregard, we see that there are four primary themes. First, the educators are slower to acknowledge and, and praise black children. 
whether it is acknowledging them in the classroom or at an award ceremony or providing them with uh, opportunities to engage in advanced uh, coursework through either gifted and talented education or honors track or whatever it might be within their respective schools that people are slower to acknowledge their intelligence and to then praise them and validate that intelligence. We also recognize that another pattern is uh, displaying a sense of surprise when we're surprised to see a black student do well, viewing black students through a disorder-based lens where we assume that any breakdown in academic performance must be a function of an underlying uh, disability as opposed to it being a function of the environment. Now, we'll come and talk about the nuances there, but it's important uh, to recognize that that is a very real pattern. We do see a very large overrepresentation of black children in special education. And then the last pattern being forced to improve one's intelligence to, to show and demonstrate even in ways when other students aren't expected to do the same thing. So let's look at just really briefly some of these patterns. So being slower to acknowledge and praise, what are some of the things that parents of black children have talked to us in the studies that we've done? Well, here's uh, from one parent. His third grade teacher didn't give him recognition for being good till the end of the year. She didn't recognize the good he did till after much time had passed. So again, waiting so long to be able to then validate students in, the, in terms of the performance that they're bringing in the classroom. Next one, my son could read second grade books by the time he was three and do math up to multiplication. The school refused to test him and had him move to the appropriate grade, saying that they could use him as an example to the other three-year-olds as to what they could accomplish. So think about that. Your child is clearly in a learning environment where they are not being challenged. They can be moved to a higher level, uh, but the response is, well, let's have your child mentor all the other children. We also see this play out in, in other ways. I'll, I'll read this one first. In second grade, her teacher gave out awards to the children. She was among the top students in her class, neck and neck with one little boy. However, her name was called with only passing interest. And while everyone was given a nice speech about their accomplishments, she received nothing but a piece of paper. Afterwards, I could tell she was upset. I lied and told her that her teacher had pulled me aside to tell me how great she was because I wanted to protect her. And we see this as a very clear theme at award ceremonies where black children are um, ignored in terms of their accomplishments, they're passed over in terms of time and description. And this next quote provides a further example of what that looks like. My son's second grade teacher did not want to acknowledge the fact that my son was the smartest in her class. Each quarter, students were rewarded based on their achievements on what grades students made. She made sure to give out the white children awards with pride and smiles on her face, even gave each one a little speech on how great they were. Only my black child's name was just called with no excitement and just handed his award with no words. We can also see this in terms of opportunities to go into gifted and talented education and those important learning opportunities. My son had the highest academic report score in second grade. At the award ceremony, the other class's teacher gave awards to the white students who had the highest, yet my son was skipped in getting an award. Teacher uh, felt my grandson was lazy and behind. We had him tested and it turns out he tested at a genius level and was just bored. The teacher ignored it. Again, we changed classrooms to a teacher who honored, respected and promoted his intelligence. Next one, my son had been making straight A's since first grade. In grade three, he was passed up for the beta club for white students. The beta club was like an advanced placement club and it says the beta club only had two blacks in it. I know because my nephew was in it and his black teacher had to fight to put him in because his scores were higher than a white child that they still wanted to be in over my nephew. My son's teacher nominated only white children. Yet during class time, my son's always was helping these quote unquote smarter students with their work and making uh, better grades than them. Next uh, theme we see is displaying a sense of surprise. Many of you uh, might know what this looks like as uh, adults, particularly those who identify as black who are listening to this or, or other people of color, where someone says to a person of color with a sense of surprise, 
wow, I didn't expect you to know that. Or, oh my gosh, wow, you're so articulate, right? And these are, are phrases that, that many uh, people of color are, are, are used to hearing and they are types of microaggressions, right? Where the underlying message is a sense of surprise of, at the intelligence. So it may come off as if it's sounding like it's a compliment, but in reality, that compliment is rooted in a sense of surprise because the expectations were low. And as I've said many times before, no one has ever risen to low expectations. So here we go. The, my youngest daughter was in daycare and she was advanced for her age. A teacher said to me that she is pretty advanced for a black child. I looked at her and asked what color had to do with intelligence. She was speechless. Nonetheless, I pulled my child out of that daycare. Here's another one. When my daughter was in second grade, one of her teachers at a parochial school indicated surprise at the diction in her speech. My daughter's diction is the same as mine, so I was confused. I was also a teacher at the same school. The teacher who was of East Indian descent said she wasn't used to black people speaking so properly and asked us if we were very American or if we were second generation. I'll let her know that all black people don't speak with the same speech patterns, just like all Indians don't, and it didn't matter what generation it was. Here's another example. And this is one where it's going back to that more classic example that I begin with, where it's a, a sense of surprise that someone, someone is so intelligent. So here we go. My daughter is now in second grade. We thought by talking with the teacher, we would minimize the damage of how she'd been previously treated. We spoke with her teacher and gave her information about Shara, Sarah's, our daughter's shy demeanor, and that she is such a smart individual. With that being said, I'm not sure she read our email. She placed our daughter on a reading level of 15 when she was a 20, the highest in her class last school year. I asked her to retest her. There was no way my daughter was performing that low, especially with our very productive summer. She tested her and said, wow, she is actually smart. Those actually smart words have stuck with me as a parent. It has been one of the most hurtful responses about my daughter. I'm sure it was unconscious, but it was painful because there was doubt, doubt that my daughter could perform well. Another example, my daughter was enrolled in a private kindergarten program where she was the only child of color in her class. At the mid-semester conference, her teachers told us with surprise that she could read. They were very excited and wanted to share this news with us. My husband and I were surprised to hear this as our daughter had been reading for a few months already. When I relayed this, her teacher said that, well, she has only recently started to participate in reading group. Always in the back of my mind, did they not notice because they underestimated her ability? How could that have gone unnoticed? We also see that our black children are viewed through a disorder-based lens, where there is an assumption that there is an underlying um, impairment of some sort. And as a result, we find that many black children are tracked into special education. Now, let me be clear, special education is a wonderful service for students who need it. But if black children are being put into special education at higher rates simply because people don't think that they have the capacity to do the work, then that's where there is a problem. And we know, unfortunately, that this is taking place across the board, but in particular with our black male students. But here's an example from a black female child or black girl. When my daughter was in started kinder, we had a teacher mention that she thought my daughter had ADHD and would need special services for her attention. I asked her if she performed an RTI and what were her results. An RTI is, is a response to intervention. She did not have any interventions. It turns out that Sarah had only been in her class for four weeks and the class was a little bit out of control. The teacher had no control over any of the students and the students did not pay attention in the class. Check this part out. There were about five to six students who were African-American. All of them were referred to special education services within the first four weeks that that teacher was there. The teacher did not have any interventions in place to have control over the class, but she was very quick to respond and place kids in special education services. We did not sign the paperwork. And then the last example that I wanna give, uh, again, all this is based upon this collaborative study that I've been doing with 
Uh, my colleague, Dr. Adara Essien, focused on Black children in early childhood. And we see this other pattern of being forced to prove one's intelligence. So this is when there's an assumption that a Black child cannot do well or a Black student cannot do well. And so when they are in a place to basically prove that they can, that they are essentially uh, forced to prove that intelligence, they're pushed um, harder, but in a way where there's an assumption that they won't be able to rise to the challenge. So here we go. In every stage, my child had to prove himself um, for any competition. The, the teacher used to ask him tough questions just to disqualify my child. Here's another one. He had been doing very well, but he consistently, but she consistently treated him like he did not. He constantly had to prove himself in ways that others didn't, even when they didn't. My teacher asked if anyone would like to read it aloud. My son volunteered to do so. However, her tone showed that she didn't think he could. As soon as he stumbled only a little bit, she immediately cut him off and asked if anyone else would like to read. And here's one last example of this. He, the teacher, had it out for him, would ask him questions all the time. He had it out for my son. It was very obvious why. He would put him on the spot to try to humiliate him with questions in the front of the class, especially if he thought it was a weak area for him. He would put him on the spot, say negative things about him when he got it wrong, trying to prove he didn't know. And if he got it right, it was, well, everyone should know that. If he got it wrong, he tried to humiliate him. It was just like an inferiority thing he was trying to reinforce. We were still struggling with his confidence. He was a year ahead going into the class. He left a year behind. So these are the real tangible outgrowths of this type of behavior. Now, when we look at this across the board, even though there's these four primary patterns, these four patterns essentially break out into kind of sub areas. And what we would say is that these seven indicators that you see on your slide are the indicators for ascribing intelligence for black children. So if you are a, a classroom teacher, a counselor, a parent, um, at any level of education, these are some of the primary patterns that you should be looking for, that you should be attentive to, that you should be aware of, and that you should be fighting against. The first is assuming. Assuming my child is unintelligent. If you're in a classroom and there is an educator who assumes that your child is unintelligent, then that is not a healthy learning environment and you need to move them into a different environment. Praising, but not praising black children, praising other children for academic successes while black children go unpraised. Avoiding, avoiding rewarding my child for academic successes. And you saw examples of that at the award ceremonies. Putting down, putting down my child in public when they provide a wrong answer. Conveying. Conveying a sense of surprise when my child succeeds academically. Oh, wow, I didn't expect you to know that. If a teacher doesn't expect you to know something simply because of your race, then that is not a person who is fitted to be in the classroom and to be engaging your child. Proving. Make my child prove their intelligence in the classroom. So again, forcing them to prove themselves even in situations where others do not have to. And presuming presuming that my child has a learning disability, a behavioral disability, but some sort of quote unquote impairment that would make it so that they are unable to do the same work. Now, this is really important. Educators put these labels on children to absolve themselves of responsibility for engaging them, supporting them and advancing their success. So we have to look out for these patterns to ensure that our black children are being treated with dignity. Now, what we do in our work, we also have some quantitative work that we've done where we've looked at specifically these indicators here, assuming, praising, avoiding, putting down, conveying, proving, presuming, right? But all of these, of course, from this negative standpoint where black children are unintelligent. And we've looked at parents of early childhood, um, uh, a student of parents of black children in early childhood education. And what we find is that across early childhood education, at least 47% of parents reported that their, that their black children received at least one of these messages 
or experience this as either an isolated issue or an ongoing issue, which is what we're seeing more of in, in our work. And that, you know, for example, you don't just get, assume that your child is unintelligent once, it's a pattern that continues. So we're looking at all of these different areas and at least 47% of, of the parents of black children in early childhood education say that their child experiences at least one of these areas of racialized mistreatment. However, if we look across the board and we look at the average, the average black child is enduring 2.9, essentially three of these ongoing experiences with racialized mistreatment in early childhood education. So now what we want to think about is of those patterns, what is most likely to occur for certain groups and then what is most likely occur to occur for others? Well, when we first look at this, we can see that on this slide, for black girls, the top three types of these messages that they're experiencing, and when I say these messages, it's not, we, we not, didn't look solely at assumptions of intelligence or uh, assuming that a child is criminal or being treated as a second-class citizen. We look across all the indicators, not just those seven, but across the, the 20 to 30 indicators we have, and these are the top ones for, for each different child group. So what does that mean? That means that if you are looking at black girls in early childhood education, the top three patterns that they experience is first, based upon our data, assuming that your, the child has a learning disability. Second, assuming that my child has parents who are less engaged. And third, mistakenly identify my child as the one who did wrong. So it's a combination of distrust, disdain, and disregard assuming lower intelligence, assuming second-class citizenship, assuming criminality. However, when we shift to black boys, we see a totally different pattern. It's all focused on the top three issues being around criminality, criminality, criminality. Singling my child out for punishment, immediately disciplining my child for perceived wrongdoing, and assuming my child is a troublemaker. So we can see that even within distrust, disdain, and disregard, that when we start breaking out intersections of different groups, we find that there are differences across groups. Now, unfortunately, we did not have a high enough population of those who might identify um, as transgender or gender non-conforming. Non uh, that being said, we, we would expect that there would be possibly a different breakout of patterns that would break up, um, across those groups. So this is important because on this slide, it tells you what you should be looking for as the top three patterns across these issues of mistreatment. So now it's time to talk about our wonderful guest speakers for today. And the first is going to be Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Gloria Ladson Billings is the former Kellner Family Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and faculty affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She was the 2005 to 2006 president of the American Educational Research Association, AERA. Ladson Billings research examines the pedagogical practices of teachers who are successful with African-American students. She also investigates critical race theory applications to education. She is the author of the critically acclaimed books, The Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers of African-American Children, and Crossing Over to Canaan, The Journey of New Teachers in Diverse Classrooms, and numerous journal articles and book chapters. She's the former editor of the American Educational Research Journal and a member of several editorial boards. And we are pleased to have Dr. Gladson Billings uh, serving as a guest for this session. And our next guest speaker after Dr. Gladson Billings will be Dr. Ivory A. Tolson. Dr. Tolson is the president and CEO of QEM Network and professor of counseling psychology at Howard University and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Negro Education. Previously, Dr. Tolson was appointed by President Barack Obama to devise national strategies to sustain and expand federal support to HBCUs as the executive director of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. He also served as a senior research analyst for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and contributing editor for The Root where he debunked some of the most pervasive myths about African-Americans in his Show Me the Numbers column. In addition, we will also have Muhammad Abdi back this week, uh, bringing us 
from the streets of Minnesota, people's perspectives on the linkage between black lives and black minds. And so we have some more people that we're going to show interviews from from that. And then lastly, our, our speaker today will also be Gwen Carr. Gwen Carr, for many of you who might already know, is the mother of Eric Garner. And she has been engaged in substantial justice work since that, that horrible murder of her son. All right, hey everyone. Um, we are very, very fortunate today to have Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, uh, one of the foremost educational scholars in our nation and an expert in black student success. And we have some of a few moments of her time here to hear about the work that she's been doing and to ask her some questions as, about the relationship between black lives and, and black minds. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Ladson Billings. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for the invitation. So um, you sent over an article that we're going to be sharing with everyone. And the title of it is The Social Funding of Race, The Role of Schooling. And I was hoping we could actually begin this conversation with you talking about that a little bit, because I think it relates directly to this conversation that we've been having as part of this class. OK, um, well, the idea for that piece came some 15 years ago. I was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And one of the requirements of fellows is that we each have to do a seminar. And I went to a seminar of one of the other fellows who focuses on aesthetics and art. And he said something that just clicked in my mind. He said, as Americans, we have no grammar for understanding art. He says, we go to an art museum, we might look at the art piece for two seconds, but we quickly go look at the writing on the side that tells you who the artist was, when, where she was born, you know, what ideas she had at the time. He said, because as a society, we have fully funded literacy, but we have not funded art and aesthetics. And when he said that, he says, I'm not talking about how much money we've put into it. I'm saying that everything we do in the society pushes you towards literacy, even if you don't want to be involved. So imagine a kid sitting in a classroom who could care less about the literature that's being um, taught. But that same kid, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I, I'm going hoarse here, but that same kid has a device and they're on it texting. They're using literacy, even though they don't want to be engaged in classroom literacy. Um, even in the most antisocial behavior you can imagine, go rob a bank. Often people go with a note, right? <laughs> they don't go with a math problem. They don't go with a chemistry equation. They go with literacy because the society funds it over and over and over again. And when he said that, I thought, that's exactly what we do with race. Even when we don't want to be engaged in it, we keep funding it. Even though we say, the social scientists say, oh, there's no such thing as race. It's a social construct. But we keep funding it. So my challenge as a teacher educator is, how do I defund a concept with people who are 19 and 20 years old who have had it funded for them since they were very young? And in the article I sent you, I give examples of very young children getting race funded for them, preschoolers. And then, of course, by the time they're in college, it's, it's hard to, quote, defund it. So I sort of think it's interesting to talk about defunding right now, because that's what we are talking about in terms of the police, that, they, that we want to defund them. 
How do we defund the concept of race? How do we have less of our energy going towards this notion of inequality, going towards this notion of hierarchy? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where the idea. So I, I was telling some students, I said, if you like Star Wars, or if you like um, Star Trek, and you follow the, 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 uh, the, the movies, there always comes a point in the series where the producer says, oh no, we gotta go all the way back to the front and do a prequel. Yeah. So you understand how we got here. So I think of this piece as the prequel to all of the stuff I've been writing about race um, over all these years. I mean, I really had this piece on my desktop close to 12 years before I would let it go. Oh, you're kidding. No, I've had it. I, I, I wrote it back in 2004. But I was just grappling and wrestling with it all these years. Mm. So I think I had it published last year. Wow. That, thank you. And I know that everyone will have a, a copy of that and will be reading it and, and learning from, from your wisdom. I, I want to change directions here just a little bit. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, our nation is embroiled in you know, marches and protests and sit-ins because of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, and numerous others. And in this class, we try to draw comparisons between the policing of Black lives and the schooling of Black minds. And, and we, and I, so when I say we, I'm referring to Donna Ford and I, since Donna isn't here for this particular interview, but we see a connection in our work in terms of the ways that Black people are undervalued and, and over-criminalized both in school and, but also in society. Right. What have you seen in your own work in, around this? Well, you know, I've been someone who has resisted the terminology that's been used to describe our kids. So I, you never find me talking about achievement gaps. Um, I think language matters. And I think the more precise we can be with how we speak about something, the better we can understand it. So I've been talking now for mm, about 14 years about this idea of an education debt. And that concept is all about what is it that the society owes black people when it comes to education? Not how far black children are behind, but what has the society been engaged in to create the debt? Now, when I first rolled this concept out, I was president of the American Educational Research Association. So this is really my presidential address. Mm -hmm. But I talked about the fact that um, there's a difference between the debt and the deficit. And most Americans don't understand this. Um, the deficit is the year to year this difference between what the nation spends and how much money it takes in. Yeah. So when you see these budget fights that they have in Congress year to year and they have a shortfall, that's a deficit. They don't have enough money to pay for what they've allotted that year. But if you take all of the deficits and add them together, and we've been running deficit government since the 1700s, so it's not new. If you add them all together, that creates the debt. And so debt is more onerous. And again, what made me think of it, and you know, it's interesting, I guess it's just how my mind works. I'll see something that has nothing to do with what I'm doing, but I, I'll relate it to education. I was sitting in a cab in New York City and, you know, stuck in traffic, trying to get across the Triborough Bridge. And there's a big sign with these numbers that are just going really, really quickly. Uh, a actually astronomical number, 13 trillion something. Mm -hmm. And the caption says, this is the national debt. And then under the sign, there's another set of numbers 
much smaller, but still a big number. And they're moving. And the caption there says, and this is your portion of it. And I thought, oh my God, I can't pay that. You know, but I asked myself, why did I feel like I was responsible for it? Well, I think the whole concept of debt is one that you can have a conversation with anybody with. I mean, people will say, oh, we shouldn't be leaving our kids all this debt. Um, yeah. You know, we can't, can't keep spending. We can't. So we all have feel some collective responsibility yeah. to not increase debt. In fact, if you look at the, the national budget, the, the three top items, defense, all the money we spend in all weaponry, right? Mm -hmm. what, what folks call entitlement. So Medicare, Social Security, that's the second thing. But number three, debt service. In other words, you just, we're just paying interest, right? Yeah. But, of all the stuff we need to pay for in this nation, that's the third thing we're, we're paying for. So I thought if I could cast the argument in terms of debt as opposed to gap, I could get people to understand that it is a collective responsibility. And I've said that debt has four components. It's historical. We didn't just start doing this. We have never ever given black children quality education, never. Okay, from the beginning, we gave them zero. And then what we gave when we said we were giving them education uh, after enslavement was substandard. We've never given them. So it's historical and it's accumulated just like the national debt. Yeah. It's also economic. If you look at the funding disparities between how much money we spend in urban centers versus suburban communities. It's not insignificant. So I grew up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia might spend about 10 or $11,000 per pupil per year. But in Lower Marion, which is sort of just across the street, it's like where, where Kobe Bryant went to high school, right? But it's a very wealthy community those people spend over 27,000. They spend over $10,000 more. Wow. And you can see these comparisons in New York City versus Manhasset, in Chicago versus Highland Park. So the question for me is why are the kids in the suburbs worth $10,000 more than the kids in the city? Because that's the only way I can understand it is that you have decided that some kids are worth more. So that's another form of the debt. So historical, economic, it's socio-political. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is, you know, black people didn't really get a right to vote, a true right to vote to, 19, to the 1965 voting rights. So certainly within my lifetime, we've just been a quote, allowed to vote. And now we've rolled that back. Yeah. Um, and so if you can't even vote for your school board representative, you know, if you're cut out, if, if you can't vote because you've uh, committed a, a felony, but you've served your time and you're off paper, okay, you're no longer on parole, but you still can't vote. And there are states that are like that, then that's another debt. And then the fourth component of the debt, which I don't have the empirical evidence for, is that I believe we have a moral debt. And so while I can't give you data on the moral debt, I can tell you that some things are just wrong. Yeah. And we've been participating in it. So when you add up that debt, um, and then, you know, this, this paper really came out in 2006. The talk was the uh, April of 2006. Um, we had just come out of Hurricane Katrina. And New Orleans was for me uh, a perfect example of how debt had become so onerous in terms of schooling, housing, employment, healthcare, because none of these things are separate. We deal with the systems as if they're separate, but they are interlocking. So, um, you know, right now I've been giving a lot of talks about um, the what I've called the two pandemics, the COVID-19 and uh, 
white supremacy are the two pandemics that I said we're fighting. And I was actually on a talk for a conference in Virginia on Friday. And one of the, the pre other presenters said, no, there's four pandemics. And I said, you know, when he laid it out, I said, you're right. He said, the other two are um, economic collapse because this thing can't keep going like this. Yeah. And uh, climate catastrophe. That can't keep going. What, what we're doing in the climate can't keep going. So indeed, what I've been calling for is something that I've called a heart reset. Um, and again, I use as an analogy, the cell phone. All of us have had that moment when the cell phone doesn't do what you wanted to do and you panic and you try a few things and you go online and you find, a, you find the, the support groups and what have you. And yep. finally, you just drag yourself either to the Apple store, or the Samsung store, or whoever does Androids. And the little person behind the desk in the T-shirt tells you, I'm going to have to do a heart reset. What they're telling you is, unless you have everything backed up, when I finish with this, all your pictures are going to be gone. All your contacts are going to be gone. And I'm going to give you a device that looks a lot like what it looked like when you first purchased it from the factory. Mm. And I've been using that metaphor to talk about this is what happens. This is what has to happen as our kids try to return to school. Everybody wants to go back. I'm saying, no, going back is not an option. You know, when they said we got to get back to normal. No, we can't get back to normal because normal was where the problem was. Yeah. We have to get to something new. Do you think COVID-19 gives us that reset? It can. Um, there's a wonderful um, Indian author named Aduhardi Ad Roy. I grabbed the paper because I, I want to make sure I read this correctly. Um, yeah who said something that, and I've been putting this on a lot of the slides that I've been showing in talks lately. She says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, our dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So yeah, I think that the pandemic does offer us the opportunity to go into a new world. The question is, will we, will we take advantage of it? Yeah, no, I, I had a conversation with uh, some superintendents in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area earlier this summer. Mm -hmm. And one of them said to me, he says, well, you know, I'm just kind of terrified about going, you know, restarting school because I'm taking a three and a half million dollar hit and I'm a small district to begin with. And I said to him, well, you're taking a three and a half million dollar hit if what you intend to do is what you did before. I said, but if you can reimagine your district, you can take whatever money they're giving you and allot it in a totally different way. And he said, you know, it never occurred to me. All I thought about was let, let me get back. So I don't know what's happening in districts where you are, but um, here in Madison, we have just removed the um, police from our high schools, our DSROs. Really? That's a big deal. Well, tell me big about it. Deal. Well, and it's interesting because in the fall, it just um, redid their contracts to bring them in. And we had a lot of protests. We have some very activist folks here um, who have been against having police in school, but nobody would listen to them. And the president of the school board is a former police officer. Oh, so well. she's saying, oh, no, no, we need this. So, so they voted and put them back in. 
But since the George Floyd incident, since the, the unrest that took place here in Madison, where they shut down State Street, uh, where we had really an insurrection, if you will, they've removed them all. So we no longer will have police officers in our, in our high schools. Um, yes. But what I think is interesting, nobody's talking about, well, what are you going to put in place? What, what, what are you, you're going to save $380,000 for those four high schools. What's going in there? Are you doing more social service? Are you, you know, are we getting some social workers, some psychologists? Are we getting any of that? Um, or are you just hoping that you'll be proven right that, oh, we need these people because it's everything is out of control? Well, I think the, 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 the biggest need that our students are going to have uh, with the reopening of schools are going to be not just social, emotional, but mental health needs. Um, the kids that I'm most invested in have seen some horrible stuff. They've yeah. seen a man die in front of their face on TV, right? They've seen a man be murdered at eight minutes and 50, 46 seconds. They've seen that in their living rooms. Begging um, for They've also seen, uh, un, you know, somebody else being chased by two former police officers and shot just because he was jogging down the street. I mean, they've seen these kinds of things, but... They've also seen death as a result of COVID-19 because their family members, their neighbors are in the so-called essential, uh, are so-called essential workers. They, you know, they work grocery stores, they drive buses. Um, so they have had no ability to social distance. Um, they've been in very, they, know they work in meat packing uh, companies. So not only have they been more exposed to COVID-19, they have contracted it, and some of them have died. And what has been missing is that because of the pandemic, people have not been able to participate in rituals that allow them to reach closure around death. There's been no, as we say in the African-American community, no home, home going, right? Or funeral. There's been no repast. There's been none of that kind of stuff that celebrates a person's life. As sad as you are, you, you, you get some closure because you get to celebrate their life. Their family comes back, their friends gather. Yeah. None of, so our kids are carrying all of that in their bodies. Yeah. They come back to school. So to me, the greatest need, the greatest needs our kids are facing are not about so-called academics but around the mental health, the, the, the trauma that they have experienced in the midst of this. You raise a really good point that that really needs to be the focus, especially going into, into this fall. I, I wanna ask one more question here before, before we conclude. Sure. And that's, you, you've been a teacher educator for, for years and have done incredible work. And so, you know, the people who are, are watching right now are, mostly educators who want to know what, the, what can they do to do different, to do better? What, what is the advice that you give to your teacher educators as you're, as you're working with and preparing them to go into the field? What, is, what are some takeaways that people can, can learn from, from your work and from um, your research in general? So the hardest part of the work that I do, and I'm here in Wisconsin, most of my students are from Wisconsin, at least the undergraduates, uh, they are from Wisconsin. They are uh, white. They are Protestant. They are um, monolingual. A lot of them are women. Um, so they have had sort of limited experiences with people different from themselves because the state is largely that. Um, and so the big challenge that I have is getting them to do what I would call a kind of archaeology of the self to, first of all, recognize that they actually have a culture because they don't think they have one. I mean, they tell me all the time, oh, well, you know, we don't really have culture. We're, we're just normal. Wow. <laughs> I said, so I guess that would make me abnormal. No, 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 no. That's not what we mean. You know, like, I mean, 
We're just regular. Oh yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay, you know, and I realize I'm not young anymore and maybe it is true, but I don't want to be identified as irregular, okay? Uh, so getting them out of that, again, that's why I said language matters. Getting them into a space where they understand, you know what, I actually do have a culture. And that culture informs how I see the world, as opposed to I'm regular, I'm normal, i.e. I'm Buses. the standard. Um, and then so it, they have yeah. had no ability to social distance. Um, they've been in very, they, they know they work in meatpacking uh, companies. So not only have they been more exposed to COVID-19, they have contracted it, and some of them have died. And what has been missing is that because of the pandemic, they're not been about to participate in rituals that, is that allow them to reach closure. Any of them, you know, it's not like we all come, you know, but I think we've always tried to do this sort of kumbaya, oh, the black, the brown, the red. We don't come to the table on equal footing. Yeah. If you are white, you have determined the table. If you are white, you have determined the agenda. Even if you have what you think of as a kind of liberal perspective, you're still in a position of power. That means um, that you get to call the shots. You get to determine what is and what isn't. And so that's probably the, the hardest part of my work, not getting them to learn about uh, Black or Latinx or here in, in Wisconsin, Southeast Asian, we have a large number of Hmong uh, students, or even the 12 tribes, bands, and federations. I mean, you know, we, we have more uh, American Indians in Wisconsin than any other state east of the Mississippi. And we actually have a law on the books that says you can't be a teacher unless you learn about the tribes and the treaties. But it's always cast as those exotic people over there. And what I try to get students to understand that every culture is local, every culture, including theirs. And, mm -hmm. and until they begin to really acknowledge that they're white and what being white means, whether they, they believe it or not, what does it mean in the society? What purchase it, they have as a result of being white? What are things they can do um, that other people can't do? Um, then they're going to sh always struggle. And I have to get them away from going into schools. And, and I have students who are very well-meaning. I don't, I don't get a lot of resistance. Uh, Madison is not the campus you're supposed to come to if you want to resist liberal ideas. You know, there, we got other campuses you could go to, but Madison is still in some way stuck in the 60s. We, we are still tie-dye. We are still, you know, th that's who we are. Um, but that's still not enough for them to understand that indeed there are some limits to this liberalism that they embrace. Um, that having never been put in a position where they've had to question their white identity, um, that's the hard work that, that, I, that I have to do with them. Um, it, you know, people say, well, why don't you, you know, have them learn more about African-Americans? Because all that does is give people a static view of culture and culture is dynamic. You know, I tell people all the time, like I'm from Philly. I love Philly. Uh, but if I go to Philly tomorrow, I would have to learn that culture again because it's changed. All culture changes. Um, that's what makes it culture. Um, so to the extent that our students are willing to really dig deep and learn about their own culture and why they think the way they do, you know, what it is that their family members believe, um, what ideas do they have to challenge uh, among gra their grandparents or their aunts and uncles. Um, and that's, it's hard for them. It's very, very hard because it's sort of this peeling back um, a myth that they've lived with for, for a very long time. Hmm. Well, well, thank you for that. As we close out, any other words you'd like to offer before we end our time? Well, you know, I, I've 
think when I talk to people about some of this stuff, they, they feel kind of pessimistic, like, well, what are we going to do? And again, I, I am a student. Well, I don't know. You get me charged up for the fight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, again, a student of history. And so I always take the long view. And I am reminded that my great grandparents were in chattel slavery. Yeah. Okay. My grandparents were sharecroppers. My own parents were the victims of legal apartheid, state sponsored segregation. My mother could not try on a hat in a downtown department store. And yet, I became an endowed professor at a major university. So yeah. I love Derek Bell's notion that just because something is impossible doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Uh, and I think if I can get my students to move out of the quote, American mindset of winning and get them to embrace the idea of struggle, because we're not called to win, we're called to struggle. Uh, and there's something noble and important about that struggle. I always give them the picture of Sisyphus, um, you know, pushing that rock, right? So he, you know, the, the mythological um, character, and he's pushing yeah. a rock up a hill that we all know, even if you only took one week of physics, you know that rock's coming back down, right? Um, but this, the, 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 the point is, it's not about the rock. It's really, if you look at any rendering of Sisyphus, whether it's a painting or a sculpture, Sisyphus has these incredible biceps. He's always drawn with these amazing deltoids. He has these incredible quadriceps. Pushing the rock has made Sisyphus stronger. So my great-grandparents in chattel slavery, total impossibility, but they pushed the rock anyway, got my grandparents into sharecropping. It's another impossible environment, but they pushed the rock that got my parents into at least segregated environments. My parents pushed the rock that got me into a totally different uh, venue that allows me to go on to college and to get a PhD and to become a professor. So educating some kids oh trust me so much easier than picking <laughs> cotton right um so that that for me is the long view and i think uh we have to have that what what we are seeing in our streets today is so exciting uh, because the coalition has broadened uh immensely you know we're having demonstrations and in in little towns in Wisconsin where there's there's like no black people there. I'm like, what y'all demonstrating? But it's like people want to be a part of of a of a movement and a change. And that to me is exciting. So the, now's the time. Now's the time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ladson Billings, for for being with us and for sharing your wisdom. My pleasure. Thank you. student at San Diego State University. This week's Black Minds Matter, we're going to be talking with community members here at the George Floyd site where George Floyd was murdered by Minneapolis police. Members of the community are sharing their experiences in education and ways they can make it better. To be, to be really honest, like I lost my accent because I was made fun of. Um, I, I lost my accent because uh, they yeah, people would just make fun of me. I live in LA, I live in Los Angeles, and I actually, I did so much so that I actually went by my middle name, which is Benedict. My first name is Faishala. And so, um, even having to adjust your own name for a cultural fit is a very interesting, like, mind twist. Do your homework, uh, be extremely patient, 
and um, just like, yeah, take the time out to actually like learn about the people that you're teaching. And that goes for everybody. And of course, like even more specifically for black kids, because as we know, again, like we come, you know, I, I grew up in the suburbs, so that's a little bit different, but growing up in like an inner city, and if you're teaching in the inner city, like you have to understand the, the community, like all how that affects that kid's psyche. So take your time and be patient. Altercation with another white male, where he called me out my name, you know what word I'm talking about, the N word. He called me out my word and I uh, pushed him, you know, and he pushed me back, so I hit him. And I got suspended for about a week and he did not get no suspensions. He got to go in the room. It's like this break room. He sat in the room for about like two hours and then they let him back go. And I had to get suspended and I, my mom had to go up to the school. My high school year, I'm a, I'm a senior right now, but I am low on my GPA and I'm back because I never got the help that I wanted and needed. I've been raising my hands in class. You know, I don't get the help. Sometimes I might slack off, but still at the same time, when I need help, you guys should help me. If I don't get no help, I feel like I don't want to do work. That will lead me to the street life that I'll be in. It was really like non-existence because the curriculum didn't match who I was as an individual and represent my socioeconomic background. So it was like I didn't learn anything that I could apply in my community. I've been unfair just like just been profiled so I could be walking on campus and I get stopped by campus police and having to deal with that situation and things like that. Me, with me being a student with my book bag and everything on campus, I'm still getting stopped by campus police. In general, teachers were basically, you know, I'd say at all black school, we're treated pretty much all the same. Uh -huh. uh, we knew, uh, of course, going through school that our uh, textbooks and everything else were just, you know, not, not up to par as, you know, the other kids, white kids and stuff. Basically in the South, it was black and white. That was it, you know, so we didn't have a lot, although I did have exposure to the other race simply because of, you know, my father being employed at a white church. The only time in school I can ever remember anything with Black History Month is being taught anything Black, okay? I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, when I was like 15, I came up here with my grandma, and so I was going to Roosevelt High at that time. It was Majora Rice. It wasn't a, a nice experience, you know, because I was like, five blacks in their school so majority was just white caucasian yeah so that wasn't a that wasn't a good experience for me i got suspended when i got suspended i didn't go back simple as that and things been different but still we still got a lot of ways we got a long ways to go everyone we are very very blessed today to have the great ivory tolson with us here um, who's going to talk with us about the work that he's been doing for many years now focused on on black students and education yeah. and so we're wondering what you see in your own work and what you're doing to address that yeah well first i want to thank you for bringing me back um how long ago was the, the first one? It was about three years ago? Yeah, about three years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so quite a bit has happened since then. Uh, uh, quite a bit has happened for you professionally. So I want to congratulate you on, on all the success uh, that you've had in your own career. Uh, and that's well-deserved success because uh, uh, your innovative platform and your ability to mobilize a lot of voices and bring some meaning uh, to, and context to some very important issues uh, and, and, and your ability to find a consensus in the scholarship uh, that, that can, can help uh, Black people to survive uh, in, this, in, in this nation uh, is quite remarkable. So I first want to thank you for that. I mean, you focused, um, you know, at least for a good period of your career, and, and you still do, on kind of debunking myths, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, you have a, a book about that. Um, what, what was the title of that book again? Uh, it's called uh, No BS, BS for Bad Stats. And the subtitle is Black People Need People Who Believe in Black People Enough Not to Believe Every Bad Thing They Hear About Black People. Yeah. And this is a copy of the book right here. 
Um, yeah. That's my, my son on the cover. Uh, my, I have my son uh, wearing the African medallion and the cardigan sweater. <laughs> uh, <our> cardigan, <laughs> cardigan sweater. Um, and the, the premise of that book is, uh, I think it's, um, it has some kinship to the Black Minds Matter concept. Uh, because the word belief in that is one of the most important words in that title to me. Because the, the ways in which children are treated has to do with people's belief system. And the susceptibility of us to very negative information about Black people and how we process that information, what we do with that information, has to do with someone's belief system. So, you know, for example, if you cared about someone or you believed in somebody, um, you know, say that this is an individual who you've worked with and you know their potential, you know their heart, you know what they're capable of, but someone came to you and said that their scores was in the bottom percentile of all of the students at that school. What you would do with that information is completely different than what you would do with it if you didn't believe in that person. So if you believe in that person, you would contextualize it in a different way. Uh, you would measure that um, uh, negative information against all of the positive things that you know and you believe about them. Uh, and you would, try to see if it's valid also, because if you really believe in that person, uh, you might discount the metric uh, because you think that it's not a fair reflection of that person. And even if you thought it was a fair reflection, you would think that it would give you information to help that person, not anything that's going to validate your preconceived notion that this person is a failure. Um, black people are collectively, and black students, uh, we are collectively in the position where the people who are supposed to be helping us devalue us. And the information that they get about us, they do some pretty detrimental things with that information. And there are other segments of the population where they do believe in, in, in them they can get the same type of negative information and it's, context, it's contextualized differently. Uh, so that belief in our failure and our inferiority, um, that sense that black minds don't matter, yeah. is one that is, it's a foundational issue of why we have these problems. Uh, in the systems that's supposed to be educating us. So given that it's such a foundational problem, what do we do? How do we, how do you convince people to value people who they inherently don't believe that their lives or their minds are of value? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I think a lot of uh, these protests and, and um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, one of the things I think it's, making us really think more about is the structural elements of the problem. Um, too often, we look at individuals when we really should look at systems. And when you really look closely at the system, there's some hard truths that we have to grapple with. Uh, like, um, there are schools that have uh, adequate representation of Black teachers but they're still failing black students. There are teachers who are trying to do the right thing and they're being penalized for it. There are principals who are working with conviction and who are doing their best to try to confront problems of institutional racism and they are being fired for it. And there's other school leaders who are doing some things that are not in our best interest uh, and they are being promoted. And so the system that we have in place 
it's just not adequate to soothe our needs. And when we really dissect that, you know, when we really think about, you know, why is it that a teacher who refuses to teach to a test or refuses to send a student out of class if they're breaking dress code because they know about this, they, they know that that student uh, is in a transitional living environment uh, and a, a student who has moved around a lot, uh, they may not have a belt at one period of time. So, so you have teachers that work in the best interest of students and they're not being rewarded for it. And it's really because there's a hierarchical process at the school and as long as white supremacy and institutional racism is embedded in society, then that filters in through the top. Yeah. And so yeah. as long as we have this structure that doesn't even, that, that, that's so disconnected from what's going on on the ground and it influences this rank and file that's supposed to act in accordance to these standards, then we're going to have these issues. Now, one of the things that, that, that I've been, been recently starting to, to look at more is, is um, models that's based on distributed agency as opposed to hierarchy. Now, distributed agency is when you have, and, and what I call it is, humanistic distributed agency. So that's based on the idea that the overall goals of, object, of, of education really should capture humanistic values. So at the top of that should be, are you working in the best interest of every child? Are you nurturing a child towards success? Are you helping a child when they are in need? Are you uplifting their self-esteem? These are things that really should be the major objectives of education, as opposed to, is the child learning math? Is the child learning science? Is the child learning reading? Now, where we are in the evolution of society, there's a lot of things that computers can teach our children, and it can give us a little bit of space to be more humanistic. You know, so, you know, everybody's heard of Khan Academy, you know, every, every school is using Khan Academy. When you really look at what students are doing on Khan Academy, they're getting from Khan Academy the things that a teacher would have given them only 10 years ago. Now, that's not to say that Khan Academy should go and the teacher should be doing that. What I think is that it gives teachers an opportunity to think about what are some of the things they could be doing now that Khan Academy can't do. Yeah. Because Khan Academy can't ask them, how's your living situation right now? And is there anything that keeps you up at night? Khan Academy can't tell them, I really like the way you expressed yourself yesterday when you got frustrated. And when those kids were teasing you, I could tell that it hurt you, but you didn't retaliate. And I know that must have been difficult. Khan Academy can't do that. Yeah. So why not look at some of these um, uh, easing the pressures of the cognitive abilities of teachers as an opportunity to promote more humanistic values and in fact make that be at the forefront of what we consider to be a good teacher, yeah. a teacher making, making standard. And when we do that, we can give, instead of teachers operating based on this standard that's set forth from the top, that wants all the teachers to behave the same way and influenced by white supremacy, we can have socially conscious teachers take a few liberties with the way that they are instructing, they can code what they're doing and record what they're doing in such a way that the distributed, the, the distributed agency 
can be facilitated through a distributed ledger. Yeah. The distributed ledger could be kind of a peer to peer support network of teachers where you benefit from the things that um, good teachers are doing. You're, you're constantly uh, evaluating a system that's based on what teachers are doing who are using humanistic values. So these are some of the things that I've been thinking about in the context of all this and, and uh, you know, these. So one of the big things I hear you saying is there is no learning without social emotional safety. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's an important concept, you know, um, can we teach these things? Can they learn these things? Uh, and I would say yes. Um, just like when we think of their ability to learn the subject matter that they're teaching students. So if we, if we go back to how teachers are prepared, um, we can go back to high school where all of them have different levels of preparation in high school and then they go to college. Some of them go to colleges with more restrictive admissions criteria, others go to more open universities, but they all go to college and they all have varying skills. Uh, in college, they learn about the content that they need to teach and they have different training opportunities. And then after they finish college, they're given the opportunity to take a test that certifies um, whether or not they have adequately prepared uh, at the college level. Then they enter a school where they have opportunities for continuing education and they also have uh, evaluations that take place of their teaching based on different things. Now, when you think about that process I just told you, where in that entire process do they have to demonstrate that they care about students? Nowhere. So not in what they're learning in, in college, not in their examination for licensure, not in how they're evaluated. Um, now, going back to what I said about how the nature of information is changing, the nature of the job of the teacher is training, uh, are, are changing. Um, really, more and more, and this and, and, and this this statement is it becomes more true every year. We are evaluating them on things that they already have assistance to do, and that is not the most important thing for them to be evaluated on. If they are using technology adequately, they don't need to memorize all the things that they need to memorize in order to get the grades in school, in order to pass the license or examination. So why don't we reprioritize what we're looking for? So just like all of those teachers come into college with different skills, they also all come to college with different humanistic characteristics. Some of them, because of their experiences, have a more natural capacity for empathy. Some of those um, teachers from impoverished communities that may not have strong academic background, but because of where they grew up, they have resilience and they have insight into this issue. So if we thought about things differently, those students would be, would make more attractive teacher candidates than a student that went to an elite private school with all these resources that has an SAT score that's in the 95th percentile. Yeah. And, 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 we can, and we can take that all the way to their evaluations. If we measure their success differently, and if we change what we consider to be a good teacher versus a teacher that needs help, uh, then we can change the outcomes for students. Yeah, you know, when you say that, you make me think of 
of course, it's not this need for folks to be able to just have this innate care. It's not just for teachers. It's for the administrators. It's for the counselors, for the paraprofessionals. Yeah. And it's not even just in education. We need the same thing in policing. We need the same thing in healthcare. Really, it's just it's the, the basics of valuing. And so you, you want yeah. you bring me to a, another question that I want to ask, which is about the, the school to prison pipeline. Mm-hmm. So it, it refers, at least, in, you know, in terms of the definition that I kind of look at, the ways that schools socialize certain students towards the criminal justice system. And there are a number of different pillars of it. There's exclusionary disciplines, suspensions, expulsions, referrals. There's perceptions that, that students aren't um, intelligent, so they're either overplaced in special education or underplaced in gifted and talented education. So would love to hear what you think about this and what mm-hmm. you believe should be contributing to this school to prison pipeline. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a lot embedded and implied in the, in the school to prison pipeline. Uh, a lot of it are things that we really need to think about. Um, and then there are some aspects of um, of the school to prison pipeline that gets uh, convoluted and clouded by you know some of the BS bad stats that I talk about in the book. Yeah. Uh, so you know when when people start saying that that um, prison beds are based on third grade test scores, reading test scores, um, that's not true, and it's also a dangerous no- notion to circulate. Okay, so Sandy, uh, the people say that prison beds are based upon third grade reading scores reading scores and that's yeah. not true that's not true okay go ahead you were about to say why. <laughs> so so when you when, when when people circulate things like that they start to make connections that can only hurt students you know so um you know there's a lot better ways to determine how many prison beds you need than third grade reading test scores. Um, uh, whether or not someone isn't reading the way that they need to read on third grade, that has nothing to do with um, their propensity to commit crime later. Um, so the things, so the, 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 um, the concept of the school prison pipeline, while is useful in organizing a lot of um, aspects of the school environment that can harm students and increase the odds that they will go to prison. It needs to be dissected in such a way where we know what we're actually working on. And you talked about some of the things that we do need to look at and we need to work on. Things like the uh, um, the suspensions, the disproportionality in suspensions. Um, also, when we look at at um, the officers that are in school, so I'm of the belief that someone who went to the police academy and they trained to be a police officer, they have no business in anybody's school. That's not the play. Uh, only if they are called in to deal with a crime, something that would be a crime inside the school and outside of the school. But when you have police officers dealing with things like a student that talks back to a teacher or a student that uh, is in the hall and refuses to go to school or go to their class, you know, things like that, then you have these, these problems. So the, the things that's related to the, the, the school to prison pipeline that I'm most concerned about is that issue, uh, disproportionality in suspensions, um, uh, special education, even, even though when it comes to academic issues, I try to disconnect that as much as I can from uh, our, our advocacy on reducing uh, the chances that they go to the prison because there's a lot of people under the false impression 
that our students that have these special learning needs uh, are more likely to commit crime um, when it's not, it's just that they're not giving the, the, the care that they need. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's something that's that, that's very important for us to look at. Um, and the, the overall, you know, one of the things I looked at, you know, just in the, um, the this whole notion of BS and and um, and school to prison pipeline. Um, one of the things that I debunk in the book is the notion that there are more black men in prison than college. Um, there are about 700,000 more black men in college than prison. The reason why I thought it was very important for us to debunk that is because I saw too many people conflating issues of reducing the number of students who are going into the prison system with increasing the number of students that we are putting in college. Those are two separate issues. Yeah. Oftentimes the students that are at most risk of not going to college are nowhere close to the criminal justice system either because their, their schools just aren't giving them the fundamental things that they need to go to college. So um, that, that set the bar kind of low. So anyway, th those are some of the, the um, you know, that's the, the, uh, the salad of thoughts that come to mind uh, when I think about the school to prison pipe. I, I do want to kind of move towards like recommendations. Mm -hmm. You know, there's gonna be people who are, are watching this and they're going to be saying to themselves, like, okay, well, he just covered a lot of, of, of big issues, some big meaty issues, but what do I need to do different in my daily practice? Uh, the thing that a school should do is try to, try to reveal students' strengths. But the way that schools are constructed now, they do a much better job of exposing students' weaknesses. It's it's a school where, where they learn that they're not a math person or that they're a slow reader or they have trouble um, paying attention, whereas it, they, they really should be learning at school that they have charisma or that uh, they're good at writing or that they're creative. Uh, they're um, a good problem solver. Um, and a, 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 Unfortunately, a student could be all of those things right now, and it can be missed by the schools because of the way schools are structured. Uh, so there's a lot of little things that we need to do that, that I, I uh, talk about in the book. Um, right now, I'm what I think right now is that we need a new era of education. Uh, I think that um, when we look at the education of Black students, of Black people, we can go all the way back to slavery, where it was against the law to educate us, to that period right after slavery, Reconstruction, where we first started to think about what education should look like, and we were being educated uh, typically for uh, functions that only serve uh, the interests of uh, the nation, uh, the you know the the white white people in this nation. Uh, and then we had a segregated environment. We were in the Jim Crow era. And then we had desegregation. And so desegregation was an era where we were trying to integrate schools. And Black people, and this was probably the first time Black people really had a strong um, agency over making uh, um, sweeping changes in education. Uh, and the, the 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 predominant strategy during that time was that if we could integrate schools by any means necessary, whether it be by busing, um, uh, whether it be uh, through incentive programs, then black people would have the same type of education as white white people. Um, now the the era right after that I would describe as a reform era. That's where desegregation went to the backdrop of what we did and it became less of a central issue. And the reform era had a lot to do with standards. So uh, having uniform standards across schools, whether it be black or white or any other type of, of a composition of the student 
and body, you have these uniform standards of success. Uh, with these standards came uh, standardization of practices, standardized tests, uh, and also some other types of, of, um, uh, of uh, reform agenda type things, including uh, things related to keeping schools safe. Uh, we had Joe Clark type of, of um, uh, aspects of it, you know, where, you know, you became tough and all that kind of stuff. So if we think about education in these terms, we're still in the reform era right now. The reform era, the, the post desegregation era, <clears throat> probably started in the late 80s, early 90s. And it's 2000 right now, or, or 2020 uh, right now. And we are still in the same era. So what we need to think about now is what does a post-reform era looks like, look like? Because we're not in it. We've, we've largely been doing the same thing for about 30 years now. So when we get beyond standardization being at the top of our priority, when we think of reform as being an archaic word, uh, when we think of things like um, teacher retention and some of these things that uh, we thought were progressive 20 years ago becomes something uh, just outdated and outmoded concepts uh, when, uh, you know, retention really shouldn't be the objective. It should be teacher excellence, you know, should be the objective. Mm -hmm. um, diversifying the teaching workforce that's good, but in this new era, we really have to think about giving, empowering teachers, not just diversifying them, because if all we do is diversify them, but we're still putting them in a standardization model, we're forcing black teachers to be just like white teachers in order to be successful. So how do we, instead of diversify, empower the types of teachers that can bring about diversity? So yeah. that's what I would uh, that's what I would conclude with is we need to to, to think post reform what does that look like and how do we advance it? So I just want to thank you for for joining us and for you know lending us your your wisdom. Uh, I hope everyone goes out and gets no BS. It's a fantastic okay. read, as I said. And again, Brother Tolson, thank you for the the great work that you are doing. Okay, everyone, we are uh, very blessed today to have Gwen Carr uh, with us. Um, Gwen is the mother of Eric Garner and is going to be joining us to really kind of talk about, again, what we see in policing and those issues, as well as how we see similar parallels in, in education. So Glenn, Gwen, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I, I want to just kick it off by by learning a little bit more. Um, we, you know, obviously what we know of your son is based upon mostly what has been seen on television. And what we wanted to hear from you is kind of going back to the beginning. What was he like growing up? What were his talents? What were his gifts? What were some of the things that he he was engaged in? We just want to hear more about him from you. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, good morning. Yes, contrary what the media and the police put out after your son's death, your, your loved one was a person. He grew up uh, in a, not a rich home, but he had, you know, what a black person can give a child as a single parent. And I was a single parent because his father uh, passed away when he was five years old. So at five years old, he had two other brother, two other siblings, um, a brother who was four and a little sister who was four months. So I had to raise these children and I did the best that I could. And Eric always act like the man of the house when he found out that he, he was the oldest and he thought that he was the one in charge. Uh, okay, so he used to, 
always be after his sister and his brother about doing the right thing or and my daughter used to get so annoyed with him he was five years older than her and she would get so annoyed with him because he was trying to play the father role in her life um i could also remember once my daughter she was about in the sixth grade and eric was a high school student and you know he used to this was before cell phones he uh we had a house phone and he took the phone from her and hung it up and she came crying to me to my eric hung up the phone and i was talking to my friend and eric hung up the phone so i says eric why did you hang up the phone and he says mom because she was talking to a boy so she replied the boy was a guy in my class and i was getting the homework from him so he told her, well, you should have got the homework while you were in class. Um, you don't suppose to be talking to no boy. You're still seeing the pediatric doctor. And so, you know, he used to do things like that, you know, to the kids. And um, he always wanted uh, to be funny. You know, he was, he was, you know, whatever he said was always funny. Family used to always want him to come to functions because he was the life of the party. He loved Christmas. Christmas was his favorite holiday. And when we re uh, reminisced as adults, he could, he could tell you every toy he had gotten since he was a kid. And I couldn't even remember all of that. And he used to say to me, mom, you gave us a good life. And I would reply, oh, I did? I said, I thought you thought I hollered at you too much. He would say, all moms holler. That's nothing. <laughs> so anyway, and then um, he was a lover of football. He loved the Giants, even though they always lost, but he was a diehard. He stuck with them. He had all kind of familiar for the, the, the Giants, all kind of things he would hang up, you know, representing the Giants. And um, he loved children. He loved people. And he always thought everyone was his friend. Even as a kid, he used to bring kids home from school, said, Ma, they was picking on him in school. So I stopped them from picking on him and I brought him home for dinner, you know. He would do, you know, things like that. And, you know, I was so proud of the person that he was because he was so caring, so, you know, thoughtful about other people's beings. And even after his death, there were so many people that came up to me to tell me the person that my son was. And when we had the big march in Staten Island, the Chamber of Commerce, they wrote to all of the storekeepers saying, I would advise you all to close your stores, board up your stores because they're having a big march for Eric Garner. And most of the stores in Staten Island kept their stores open that day and said, we are keeping them open in honor of Eric Garner. And I thought that was so touching. And one storekeeper told me, he says, I made more money that day than I ever did since I had this store open. And um, it's just so many things that I can remember. He, he loved school. Uh, although his teachers used to tell me, he, they, they said they never had a problem with him doing his homework. When he was in high school, the teacher said the only problem they had with that, when he was in, say like if he was in math class, he would be doing his English homework. When he was in English, he might've been doing his science homework. So they say he's always doing his homework in school. So I says, Eric, you can't do your homework in school. You have to bring it home. I said, why do you do your homework in school? He said, so I could have more time to go out when I come home, you know, so I get my homework out my, out the way. I said, but you must do it at home. But he didn't listen. He still would do it in class, you know. And uh, but the teacher said he he always had it. He didn't have a problem with that. And he did uh, attend school. He went for two semesters in Ohio. He went to school in Ohio for college. And um, I was just so proud. I think I. I I was more proud of him going to college. You know how kids are. They'll go, but the parents are more prouder than the student themselves. I was shopping every day, buying sheets, buying 
heavy clothes, buying raincoats. And he said, Ma, I don't need all that. I said, yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> so he was just, he was my firstborn. And no matter how old he got, he was still my baby. He, me and him were so close. And as adults, as children, I remember once he came home, uh, it was the like the last day of school, and he come running home, I think he was about in the fifth grade, and he came home and he had this certificate in his hand, and he was saying, Ma, Ma, we did it, we did it. I said, what did we do? He says, look, I got 100% attendance. I says, oh, wow, that's beautiful. I said, but you did that. He said, no, you got me up every morning. <laughs> wow. I mean, I hear the pride and joy in your voice as a mother of a son as well. So, you know, thank you for sharing that because we just don't know. So yeah. I, we appreciate hearing his school experiences, but not just school experiences, but his personality mm -hmm. being very empathetic and compassionate mm -hmm. and that you two had a loving relationship. And he also had a really positive um, relationship with the rest uh, of the family and others. We'd like to, uh, I'm going to ask one more question here and then turn it over to Donna because I know she has questions too. We've been, we've been, waiting for, uh, for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, his experiences in school? You mentioned, you mentioned some of the positive things. Were there any challenges that he faced, any barriers, anything that, that stands out? Sounds like he was a, a very strong student. Yes, he, he was a strong student. And anytime, if he had a problem, he, he didn't have too many problems in school with uh, his you know, with his classmates, the teachers always talked highly about him. Um, but they just said, you know, he wasn't a person to like, if you, you know, you confronted him, he was going to face it. Now that that's how he was. Uh, I remember one time he was in the home ec class. The teacher said that they were going to bake a cake that day. So he said they had the cake mix on the, the table. And he said he told all the guys to write down the recipe, you know, for the cake. So he said he, Eric was doing it. All you know, the students was doing it. And but he said Eric had he had just he had a fresh haircut. He had a, you know his hair was cut very close. And one of the students came up behind him as he was writing down the recipe and popped him in the back of the head, you know. And you know how kids kids do do those things. And so he said, Eric just jumped up. He got so angry and he went to grab the student and the teacher got in between them. And, you know, he just said, if either one of y'all pass any lick, you're both going to get suspended. If you, you know, if either by, if anybody passed a lick, he said, so Eric said was so, so frantic, so in a frenzy about him hitting him in the back of the head. He said he didn't hit him, but he took the cake mix and slung it out the window. So anyway, I said, oh, my God. So he came home, Eric came home that day and said, Ma, you have to come up to the school. I said, what did you do? Ma, um, they'll tell you when I, I didn't really do anything, but the teacher will tell you. And I just kept on fussing, tell me what you did. And he wouldn't tell me what he did. He just said I had to come up to the school. So I went up to the school. So this is the story that, that the teacher told me. So anyway, he says, I, you know, so when he, the teacher took me to the side and he says, I don't blame Eric. He said, I would have been furious just like him because Eric was minding his business when he got popped in the back of the head. He says, and really, he says, I'm glad he took it out on the cake mix instead of on the boy. He says, but only thing I told him, he could have hit somebody downstairs with the cake mix, you know, with the box of cake mix. And so... He said, so, you know, don't be too hard, but I just have to address these things, you know. So I said, okay. So anyway, Eric left with me that day and I was fussing. I said, Eric, if you get mad, you can't do that. You can't throw the cake out the window. He said, no, Ma, but he made me mad. I said, I know he made you mad, but you cannot do that. So anyway, he came down. I said, that's all right. We'll talk about this when we get home. 
let's just not talk about it anymore now. Let's talk about it when we get home. So anyway, he went. So we went downstairs in this street where he went to school. Your kid, the traffic was so going back and forth, back and forth. You can't cross. I said, where's the light? We can't cross the street. So we, I stood there for about five or 10 minutes and the traffic never stopped. So then I looked at Eric. I said, Eric, how do you cross this street? So he said, oh, he said, you have to go up over this ramp and then go across the street. I said, the ramp? He said, yeah, because you can't cross the street here because there's no light. You have to go over the ramp. I said, well, you see me trying to cross the street. Why did you tell me? He said, you told me don't say nothing to you till we get home. So I said, oh, you were being smart, huh? <laughs> and how are his teachers? Were his teachers pretty good? Were they invested and engaged for the most part? They were pretty good because I always... Even though we didn't have cell phones, I used to tell the teachers of my children, call me at night when I get home from work. If there's any problems, call me or anything that, you know, that's going on. If he's going on any trip or anything, call me and let me know. Because kids, you know, they tend to forget, you know, when they're supposed to bring in this or bring in that for school. So I tell them to call me and they did. So I used to have a pretty good relationship with the teachers of my children. Mm-hmm. When okay, thank you. Um, so every whenever you hear or every time you hear about police brutality, incidents like those, where does your mind go? What are your thoughts since your son's murder? Well, police brutality have become more vivid in my mind and more vigilant since my son's death because before my son's death I used to hear about it I used to hear people talk about it but being that I had never experienced it I didn't know that the problem was so severe I didn't know that police was just beating up on people in the black and brown communities and just actually banging their heads up against the cement actually just beating them bloody, shooting them, killing them. I really didn't know until I did a check. When I start looking back over the statistics and uh, seeing actually the people whose children has been shot, and most of them were unarmed children, uh, and they were mostly in the black and brown communities. And so then I started paying attention more. I started like just looking back and saying, wow, we have been really, really in this day and age been mistreated and abused, brutalized and killed for many, many years. So Gwen, and I hope it's okay to call you that. Yes. So how do you, um, how do you, how have you been coping? How do you cope? Well, first of all, I have to pray a lot to cope because without the strength of the almighty investing in me, there's no way that I could do this work. But I do lean on his everlasting arm. And I do, when I start getting a little antsy or a little, you know, frustrated, I said, you know, I think back and I think about the good times. I think about the years that I had with my children that was so positive. And uh, another way of my healing is helping other mothers, helping other family members. Because a lot of people really don't realize there are ch- there are mothers and fathers and family members that are in a very dark place. Their children are murdered or severely injured and it's just swept under the rug. You never hear about it. And if you listen to the stories, one story gets worse than the other. Mm -hmm. And so there are mothers who are actually on strong medication. Some mothers can't get out of bed in the morning. And there are other mothers who have even attempted suicide. There are so many cases out there. They call us the mothers of the movement, but actually 
um, we are only the face of the mothers of the movement. There are thousands or tens of thousands of mothers of the movement who we try to get in touch with. And that's part of our healing is helping someone else to cope with this terrible tragedy that they have to endure for the rest of their life. Every year I have a commemoration ceremony, which the commemoration would be tomorrow. Um, Eric was killed six years ago tomorrow. And I try to bring mothers from all over the nation to my space and we commemorate together. And I always tell them, let's focus on the happy times that we had with our children. We all know the tragedy, but let's focus on the silly things he did or she did. <laughs> let's focus on um, how they made you laugh and things like that. And a lot of times this, this, this works, this works. And then we go to the park for like a big family picnic. Uh, we go to plays. We just do things like to release some of the, the, the anxiety that's inside of us. So I tell, I tell every mother that they are invited to my event, even though sometimes I don't have the funding to bring them, but all the funding that I get, you know, when I am campaigning for this event, all the funding that I get, I put it into bringing mothers to my event for their room and board and their flight um, expense is what I do. So what is that organization or? It's the, is... uh, it's the Gone Away Foundation. Okay. That, um, that's my foundation. This is who, um, this is what I do my work through. Uh, we, I go and I help people give out meals to the homeless and the people who are less fortunate, uh, who, especially during the pandemic. Uh, I was going to National Action Network on a regular couple of times a week to help feed the hungry. And um, even though I know it was a pandemic, but I know people still have to eat through in the pandemic. So I offered my services a few times a week. Mm. Well, I appreciate hearing some of the ways that you are um, sharing with uh, listeners, with the um, reg those who registered, how to you know try to cope. And there may be other ways, but I appreciate how you have found your way in um, helping others. Yeah, and yeah. I also, I also, uh, coping was going to legislators to get laws passed. That was one of my ways of getting some relief of uh, coping or, you know, like dealing with my pain. If I could get laws changed to save others, myself and other mothers in New York, we did go to Albany lobbying, uh, talking to lawmakers about changing the laws. And lo and behold, we did get some of the laws changed. Uh, even uh, five years ago, we got the executive order for the special prosecutor from Governor Cuomo, which was mm -hmm. a, a big victory because that had never been done before. And now it's not only an executive order, it's a bill. And we also got the STAT Act passed. We got the 50A repeal passed and the Eric Gardner Mm -hmm. I chokehold bill of a uh, pass. So outstanding even work. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. And so again, thinking about myself as a mom. Um, so tomorrow's gonna be six years, and then I don't know when was your son's birthday? Um, my son's birthday is September 15th. Um, he would have turned 50 years old on September. Ah, he would have turned 50. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, um, are those same things that you talked about earlier in terms of coping, you do that for Eric's birthday and for this, that tragic day, which will be tomorrow? Yes. Well, what I decided this year was that I wasn't going to commemorate his death in that way. Instead, I decide to celebrate his life. 
on September 15th this year, I want to declare, you know, myself, I want to declare September 15th, Eric Garner Day. Mm, I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on it. Thank you. Thank you. So you've been engaged in a lot of work trying to address issues in policing. Where do you think things need to go to change what we're seeing? Well, actually, the first step would be in changing policing is I hear people saying they need more training. They need proper training. But all the training in the world is not going to do any good if there are police officers who's on the force that are on their own agenda. They already know right from wrong, but they do as they please and their superiors do nothing about it. They uphold them in their wrongdoing. They don't hold them accountable. And before we get, had gotten this 50A repeal, there was no transparency. We never knew what the officer's records looked like. We didn't know if they had any incidents, any um, killings on their records before our children were killed. And the only way I found out was through um, the leaks, the WikiLeaks, that Officer Pantaleo had 14 allegations. And he had, um, could you excuse me one second? Yes, um, excuse me. Yeah, Pantaleo had 14 allegations, four substantiated um, cases, and seven pending. So an officer like that had no business on the streets at all. I said, if they had gotten rid of that officer or put him on that so-called desk duty before the day that my son was murdered, my son may have been here today. Okay. And... Second of all, this system that we have is working as designed. It was, it's working to impair the black people, the black and brown communities. When they first had the policing, it was to catch slaves, slave runaways. So that's what it's doing. So this system needs to be torn down and rebuilt. So it would benefit all people, not just, I mean, be a slave catcher for the black and brown community. And the only way we're going to do that, we are going to have to heal hearts and change minds. Else, nothing else is going to work. You know, it's so real when you when you say this, because I, I think Donna and I see very similar things in, in education with not, of course, not all teachers, but certainly some teachers who, mm -hmm. like you say, may go in with the wrong disposition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we find is like, particularly around like suspensions, mm -hmm. it's not all the teachers. It's usually a, a small group of teachers who do a ton of suspensions mm -hmm. and treat kids um, like they don't belong. And not just in early elementary, but all, I mean, all the way up to doc, doctoral level education, we see the same thing. Yeah, because I know in, in education, I, I have a, you may know her, she is a friend that I grew up with. And um, I always call her a lifetime student because she's still going, at her age, she's still going to school. Um, Sheila Evans training. She been going to school, she's been, uh, commissioner. She's been everything in the school system. And she just loved kids. She just loved to teach. And it's been like that since we were elementary. She always says, oh, I'm going to be a teacher when I grow up. And she did. She went far and beyond teaching, you know. And most of the people, she knows just about everybody. So that's why I said you may know her. because She's been all over. <laughs> and um, I just love to hear the way that she talked about her students, about the people she said, you know, because because she, you know, hires and fires principals. That was her job at one time. And she says, um, she told me one story about a principal she was about to hire. And she says, and you know, she says her credentials was good and 
I, you know, was ready to, to hire her. She says, and then someone sent me um, this clip off of YouTube where she was stripping. And I, she says, my goodness, why would she get on YouTube with that? <laughs> you know, and, you know, she says, and I, I'm just so sorry that I can't hire her because this is not the, the kids to see this image. And, you know, what are they going to think, you know? But um, she was so sincere in her job, really, really sincere. And um, I just think that a teacher should put a lot into the, the black minds of America because there are so many prolific minds and they're just waiting to be used or waiting to, you know, to be explored. And I even look at my grandchildren and then I have a, a 13 year old who's always on the honor roll. And he takes, he takes pride, but he's sort of laid back, but he, he takes pride in it. But I'm, I'm trying to get him to speak out more, but he won't hit with me. He, he's very vocal or he's always got these little things that he always says to me. But for him to get out in public speak, he won't do that yet. And I'm trying to, to do that with him. I said, you have to share some of what you have. Yeah. Well, I would just say we have to stay mindful. We have to invest in our young people. Um, and now even as the marches go on, we have to keep the fire burning because we know that the marches are good, but they seem to dwindle down after a while. And if we don't hold the politicians feet to the fire, it's just gonna get swept under the rug like so many other things have done before. And let's not tell our children, oh, you can't learn. Uh, you're stupid, um, or why do you act like this? Invest in them. You have to say, sometimes it's not, you want them to come into your world, but sometimes you have to go into their world. And we must remember that a black mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> right on. Thank you. Right on. It is. <laughs> thank you. I mean, seriously, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing uh, your experiences and with us about Eric's life. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we appreciate your time. Oh, okay. Now have a great day, both of you. <laughs>